Hey guys, this episode is going to be a little different, and that there's really no relevant gameplay footage I can show you, because it's not in the game files. I wouldn't even know enough about it to make this video, except for the help of one of New Vegas' developers. So before we get started, I want to give a very special thanks to Jason Fader, who worked as tech producer on New Vegas, for making this video possible. He endured what was undoubtedly an annoying torrent of tweets from me and answered my questions brilliantly. Those of you who have played around with New Vegas' console commands might actually be familiar with his work, maybe without even being aware of it. There's an unused cell called Mintat's Test Level, full of some giant mantis, rats, powder gangers, and numerous brahmin. It also contains an unused debug weapon called the Faderator. While some fans have speculated that the Faderator was a cut weapon named after him, it was actually never a plan to appear in-game. Jason made the level himself and used the cell and weapon to test game physics, then simply later forgot to delete the files when he was done. Music is by far one of the strongest aspects of every Fallout game, and New Vegas was no different. Well, except maybe for that one song. Johnny Guitar Nope. Not again. And the same goes for the series radio stations. New Vegas was at one time planned to have an additional radio station called Wild Wasteland Radio. Obviously, you would have needed the Wild Wasteland trait, but the station wouldn't have simply appeared on your pit boy. First, you would have had to travel to Novak and speak to a wacky vendor who sold random junk. Jason had wanted this character to be Nobark Noonan, as it was one of his favorite characters to provide temp VO for, and it would have fit his story. Jason even wrote extra lines of dialogue for him, where he would have acknowledged you as a true believer, and that he has some items that would help you. One of these items would have been the tinfoil hat. By equipping the tinfoil hat, the Wild Wasteland radio station would automatically come on, just as it would have stopped when the player removed the item. Jason had wanted the show to be hosted by Art Bell, who was famous for his paranormal-themed radio show, Coast to Coast AM. Sadly, Art Bell passed away earlier this year. However, if they couldn't get Art Bell, Jason was going to voice the role himself, while the other members of the development team would have called in as wacky characters they created, typically dealing with weird or paranormal stories. For instance, Larry Liberty, who was lead designer for half of Fallout New Vegas' development, would have called in as Captain Liberty, a self-proclaimed hero of the Wasteland. Jason also planned to use his temp VO voices, something we'll talk about later in this video, to voice ads that would have played prior to caller segments. These commercials would have advertised mint ads, fancy lads, and even a used wind brahmin salesman. As to why Wild Wasteland Radio didn't make it off the cutting room floor, Jason replied, It didn't get beyond high-level design. It was approved, but we ran into a strange issue with localization. Since the point was to have the devs call into the radio show, localizing the VO would ruin the easter egg, and it wasn't an option to have English VO mixed in. You want to buy Win Brahmin? Jason continued that he and Frank Kowalkowski, lead programmer of New Vegas, jokingly talked about a Win Brahmin or Tumbleweed NPC that would spawn near the player and then roll away. If the player happened to be observant and noticed the Win Brahmin and happened to have the Wild Wasteland perk, they could pet it, say nice things to it, and eventually it would follow you. After befriending the Wind Brahmin, it would randomly spawn in and then either follow you for a bit or attack a nearby enemy. When describing it, he referenced the movie Rubber, which if you haven't seen it, the plot revolves around a sentient homicidal tire. It's just one of those movies that you'd never forget. Jason was queer to add, this isn't a cut companion though, since it existed purely in our minds after a late night of work. As mentioned earlier, Jason planned on voicing the Wild Wasteland radio commercial segments using his temp VO voices. When I asked him about this specifically, he answered a question that I've had about New Vegas for some time now. In the game's files, there are many cases of unpolished dialogue that were clearly recorded by the developers. 
I had assumed that these were used for testing in some fashion, and Jason confirmed why. The temp VO was based on near final dialogue. I ended up doing it to help the designers test their content. If any dialogue didn't have a voice file with it, the dialogue line would only be on screen for one second. If the dialogue line had a VO file, the line would be on screen until the VO finished playing. I had a lot of fun doing it, and tried to make the quality convincing enough. He continued, sharing more information about the characters that he voiced. I remember early on voicing the entire town of Novak. The weirdest part was voicing an elderly Scottish man and his elderly Southern Belle wife. When they would banter in front of the player, it was my voice in both. It weirded the team out. Another time, I had voiced all of Doc Mitchell. My voice was in there for quite a while, to the point that once we got the final VO for Mike Hogan in the game, the team missed my voice and preferred it over the final. We got used to Michael's version eventually. Sometimes I'd get it wrong. In one of the vaults where you watch a propaganda video, I voiced the narrator in a very dark British voice. Eric Finstermaker heard it in-game and said it was too Dark City, and wanted it to be more like a happy 1930s radio voice. I didn't voice the female characters that much. Frida Wolf did the temp VO for a lot of women early on, and was basically my coach early on. I followed up with Frida Wolf and asked her about her experience with New Vegas' development, to which she replied, I was laid off very early in pre-production because the Aliens RPG was cancelled. I remember I was free in-house labor. They have to pay me union scale now. I had assumed that Obsidian had some sort of automated process for replacing the temp VO with the game's final VO, but Jason revealed that this wasn't actually the case. Oh, as for replacing the temp VO, it was a manual process, and sometimes my temp VO didn't get replaced and accidentally made it into the final game. I think most of those instances were patched out eventually. One case of my VO being in the final game was through a script error in EDE that would trigger my VO. It was a test script that was supposed to be disabled, but a bug could turn it on. Akeel Hooper's voice direction on the EDE thing was to have two wildly different voices so that he could tell them apart. One voice I used sounded like classic Dracula, and the other was based off of Inigo Montoya from Princess Bride. A YouTube video came out showing the VO bug, and you could hear my Montoya voice. There was a comment in the video asking who the voice actor was since it sounded authentic to them. That was funny and weird. Could you bring your robot to one of our patrols so they can examine it? I'll have the robot mark the location on your map. Could you bring your robot to one of our patrols so they can examine it? I'll have the robot mark the location on your map. Oh, and as far as how long it took, FNV had a lot of lines to record. I think I ended up doing temp VO for about 70% of the game. It took me about 10 to 20 hours per week spent after work on my own time. I had a lot of fun doing it, and I gladly volunteered my time for it. I asked if volunteering after work was common on the project. For me, yes. I had a lot of free time back then, and loved working on the project. When I wasn't doing VO, I was doing tools programming to get things more efficient for the dev team. I basically did whatever I could to help the project. Typically when we as fans talk about New Vegas' developers, the conversation usually includes a short list of names like Josh Sawyer, Chris Avalon, John Gonzalez, etc. But this interview made it clear to me that Jason Fader is one of the unsung heroes of one of the best games ever released. His passion for the game was evident in his responses, and his extensive unpaid work on the game undoubtedly improved the final product. And that's all I have for this episode. Thanks for watching guys, and like and subscribe for more content like this.